right. So welcome to Roots Reality Experiences. Today I'm joined by Brandon Lloyd, who is a former all-pro wide receiver of the National Football League and founder of a private music publishing entity. In addition, Brandon has done work in aerospace and medical technology sales, worked with the nonprofit's Blessings in a Backpack in the Denver Dream Center, and currently serves as a business partnerships and apprenticeship ambassador at CareerWise Colorado which is a registered youth apprenticeship nonprofit. So Brandon, thanks for coming on. Thank you, happy to be here, Ben. So just starting off, um, do you remember the first sport that you ever played? Uh, organized sport? Yeah. Oh yeah, flag football. Flag football, how old were you when you first started playing? Third grade in the uh, okay. uh, Blue Springs uh, Football League. You know, it started in, um, uh, with with flag, which is the mm -hmm. introduction into the sport of football, but it was it was it was flag football in Blue Springs, Missouri. Okay, and so before that, did you ever play like any like t ball or or soccer or was no was football the you, first? You know, when I was when I was younger, you know, I was diagnosed with you know attention deficit disorder and. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a pretty rambunctious kid. I you okay. know, couldn't sit still. You know, I would I have trouble reading because I couldn't sit still long enough. Right. Okay. <laughs> and, sure. Sure. And you know, so I you know I was getting the Ritalin, and my mother didn't like how it was uh, changing my mood. Oh. Okay. And so yeah. she took me off of it. So I had to navigate the world and and figure out how I was going to interact with the world uh, without that. Um, uh, pharmaceutical assistance sure and my dad introduced me to football oh okay. so he took me to the library and we got buddy ryan i don't know if you remember him he's old, yeah. he old school football coach he yeah, got me the yeah. buddy ryan uh book and uh the companion vhs tape okay and i got another vhs tape and it was just about the positions of the football the 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 stances Mm -hmm. the rules and that's when I fell in love with football I was I'd sit there and looked at that VHS and I just could not believe it I was just so excited to sure. put on a helmet to wear the pads the cleats the the you know be the kicker I wanted to be the kicker the punter the quarterback <laughs> you know, everything I, oh I wanted to do everything so you know when when I was introduced to football you know I fell in love it was it was immediate love at first sight that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, did you, so were you, like, as soon as you started, did you start dreaming about becoming a professional football player, or was that later on? You know, I studied professional athletes mm -hmm. because, you know, my parents, you know, blessed me mm -hmm. with a Sports Illustrated subscription, and okay, yeah, so I, I read a lot, a lot, a lot about sports, yeah, and professional athletes and particularly it was it was just it was all the sports but mm -hmm. particularly it was Deion Sanders who really yeah. caught my eye when I was sure. younger and um but I, I'd say prior to that it was the the Joe Montana Jerry Rice connection mm -hmm. I really enjoyed Warren Moon and Randall Cunningham yeah, I I enjoyed uh, James Reed and Jim Kelly connection. So I, I and then as far as the defenses, obviously it was just you know watching football in the late '80s and '90s was just yeah it, it, was, it was like the glory days of 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 NFL sports. But uh, beyond that, we watched everything. It was motor sports, uh, yeah. tennis. The Olympics, I was just, I mean, I was, I'd be glued to the TV at all hours of the day watching yeah. the Olympics as a youth. I, I just, I, I, I really love the Olympics, but you know, anything sports related, I was obsessed with it as a youth. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's that, that kind of rings a bell with me because I remember like me and my brother growing up. My, my dad was always super obsessed with sports. And so me and my brother got indoctrinated pretty quickly that we would be sports fans and just, watch everything basically you know just go as many games as we can and collect like sports cards i don't know if you ever did that but uh that that was a big a big thing to do so what was your what was your favorite sports card 
Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one. So I was always, I was collecting hockey cards, basketball cards, football cards, and baseball cards mostly. Um, so, the, like, so the Gretzky, the Lemieux. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Gretzky cards. My my brother was a, a big Gretzky fan. I had a my favorite hockey player was Paul Korea, um, who played for the Anaheim Ducks for a number of years. And uh, but um, yeah, I I enjoyed uh, gosh just collecting all these cards and just, you know, whenever I could save up money, I would go and try to buy, his, <laughs> buy a new pack of, of cards and, and like have trades with my brother and stuff. And so Same. it was just kind of a, a fun, fun thing to do. <laughs> now, have you, have you kept your cards and have you, with the, with the rise in cards, are you going back and revisiting the cards you have and seeing the, the value? To, to a certain extent, I mean, yeah, I, I have all the cards. I've, I've never gotten rid of any of the cards I have. I'm sure I have a few cards of, of you, actually. Um, but <laughs> but uh, it's actually I have a funny story about that, too, because, like, so I've been keeping all my cards, and I just have just boxes of, of sports cards. But I, I also would collect, like, pennants, like different team pennants from all the different sports leagues. And so... I would go because Kansas City Chiefs are my local team. Whenever we could, my dad had a thing with at work where they would like be able to everyone chip in to get season tickets, like and split the season tickets. So we'd go to a couple games every year for a little while growing up. And uh, whenever I'd go to games, we would go super early, and I would go and try to get autographs. And I remember, I think I was thinking the Broncos had come to Kansas City, and I actually sort of met you and got your autograph at a game actually once so awesome <laughs> so it's kind of funny now that yeah that's right full circle you know talking so <laughs> yeah fun but uh yes yeah, so that was always just kind of a, a fun thing for me you know it's always cool to be able to just collect uh sports memorabilia and, and sports things it's a it's a cool thing to do so. yeah it is yeah i still my favorite cards were you remember back in the 80s how popular Canseco and Bonds oh, and yeah. Mark McGuire. And now, like, all those cards are worth, like, $3, $2, $1. Right, yeah. <laughs> I thought they were going to be huge. You know, I had, like, yeah. the, the uh, Bobby Bonilla, the Barry Bonds. And it's like all those guys just went down in, like, horribly, in horrible fashion. Um, I, I obviously, the Michael Jordan cards, the oh, Bo yeah. Jackson cards. I'm just surprised that um collecting those cards to just how the, they just did not maintain the value that I thought that they were gonna maintain yeah. when I yeah. originally had them and how special they were to me yeah uh, when I when I first had them and now I yeah, I'm hearing all these um card booms and uh yep. people's like oh just a random card I had just laying around and now it's worth a million dollars then yeah just, that's right if maybe you have I was like I yeah. had poor taste in baseball players when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's some of the, the sales that you see for cards are just incredible, like millions of dollars for, and usually they're like some rare, like rookie card of like a, I know like a Tom Brady rookie card and a Gretzky rookie card sold for like millions recently. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think I ever got too many cards that were that valuable. Uh <laughs> That's those are hard to find. You have to be like one of the super collectors, I think, to get those. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I got remember, some good Shaquille yeah. O'Neal cards. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. And at the time, I thought they were they were going to be good. Obviously, he had an amazing Hall of Fame career. And oh, sure, yeah. But uh, you know, the cards didn't really materialize into much. <laughs> yeah, I, I think any cards I have would probably be like worth like a, I don't know, like twenty, fifty dollars max or something. None of the none of the cards. I got were yeah the the super super rare ones so but uh, just a, a fun fun hobby to have and a great way to like get to know the different players and really study the game by looking at the stats on the back of a card or something so that's always a, a cool thing to do. Oh yeah, I would sit in front of the football games with my cards. Yeah. <laughs> or sit in front of the baseball games with my card book out. Yeah. And th that those are that was, those are fond memories. Oh yeah, I remember, yeah, I, the card book thing. I totally relate to that because I would like have people organized by team, and if they got traded, then I would move them to a different part of the book. Like, oh, you're on this team now. <laughs> so good. Uh, I think actually probably the funniest thing was because I, my brother, his favorite sport was hockey. Um, 
I was kind of mixed in with all of them, all the sports I kind of liked equally at different times. I might, you know, sort of focus on one more than the other, but like, he would have like a, an all-star collection. He would basically create his own all-star list of players based on their stats and like induct them into his all-star collection. And so, so he'd like, okay, this person's had like five straight good years. He's now one of my all-stars and he would put them in a special section. Of, <laughs> and so I would try to copy him and also create my own all-star list and stuff. But so, yeah. so who's doing better in fantasy now? Oh, it is it fantasy? Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting thing. I actually, in my, I have a fantasy football league and uh, have a group of guys that's been in for like, we've been going for about 10 years now. Is your brother then, in this league? He's in the league. And so it's a big rivalry. We do not like each other much when we play. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've actually won the championship back to back years now. So I'm uh, yeah, doing pretty well, but uh <laughs> So did that card, that, that experience with the cards in the past, is that pan forward to your I, fantasy? I think so. I, I think so. Yeah, I think all the studying of the statistics for players that helps me understand uh, when it comes to fantasy football. I, I'm more familiar, I think, with breaking down uh, which players to have on my team. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it must be that because – I don't know what else would allow me to win two in a year, two in a row. So it's. <laughs> are you in a fantasy football league? I'm not. I'm not. Okay. I, I I can't keep up with it. Yeah, it's a it's a lot. It's a lot of managing <laughs> to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, this is a kind of funny question. When you were playing uh, in the NFL, did you know guys who were on your team that were in a fantasy football team? Yeah, yeah. Uh, notoriously, Chris Cooley, when I Chris was Cooley? on the Washington football okay. team, was notoriously in fantasy sports. Yeah. And this was 2006, so it was probably what is like you know three years into, yeah, you know, the the height the right. heightening of fantasy yeah. sports. And Chris was notoriously in fantasy sports. The other player was Champ Bailey. Champ Bailey. <laughs> Oh, and he'd talk about it too. Oh, yeah. He'd be like, he'd be like I knew you were going to go off today. That's why I started you. <laughs> That's so hilarious. Okay. Those are, those are uh, two players. Yeah. Wildly famous players. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, obviously definitely. Champ's a Hall of Famer. Right. And, uh, and Chris was just an absolutely amazing baller. Oh, yeah. But two amazing players. Were that's funny that's funny and was, so so they had so i guess champ bailey had you on his team and he's like telling you like you better you better step it up today <laughs> you know it <laughs> that's funny that's funny did chris cooley have himself on his fantasy team i i don't recall i don't okay. recall i just wonder what that I, dynamic I'm sure he would be did. like <laughs> well i'm sure he did i mean the the play yeah. calling was so bad the ball went to him every time so it, he'd be <laughs> foolish not to get them still yeah <laughs> <laughs> Unless someone else was got him got him before him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I picked him up. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. So when did you uh I guess when did you start to really understand that you could go pro? Right. So the you know it so it started off right off the bat, you know, in that yeah. blue springs little league you know the mm -hmm. first kickoff i caught touchdown okay wow yeah the, the the team went three and out punt it i took the punt touchdown and it was okay you know, and i was the smallest kid on the field right and it was kind of like oh wow i need to stay out of trouble so i can do this mm -hmm. so that was what my father introduced me to was right. purpose he it, it, football gave me purpose Sports yeah. gave me purpose in life. And, and that was what was so profound about that introduction into football. Yeah. And, and, you know, thank the Lord that I gravitated towards it like I did. Sure. I, I recorded Deion Sanders' games, mm -hmm. and I started emulating how he played. Yeah. You know, I read his autobiography and when I was in the seventh grade. And, you know, that in conjunction with reading uh, Sports Illustrated, you know, the, the rise and the fall of a lot of people, you know, from, yeah. the, from the 80s. 
and a lot of success, you know, that I was reading about. So I studied professional athletes for a long time. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, you know, I was just gifted with the ability to be able to see it on TV and, but I was recording them. I, and that was what was different between me and the other students. So I was in a film study mind state early in my life. So I would record it and then I'd be replaying them. I would put it in slow-mo and adjust the tracking so that line would get out of the way. You know, okay. that fuzzy line yeah. that was going across. Yeah. <laughs> so it would get out of the way. And then I can see them doing the moves and okay. then I'd emulate them in practice or in the backyard. I would yeah. do those in games and p the pickup football games. I was doing the Jerry Rice moves. Yeah, um, I was doing the Deion Sanders moves. I was doing the Deion Sanders celebration. So it was yeah. even that part of the entertainment factor of being a professional athlete. That's sure. what I was really studying also. So um, both of my parents are public educators. Um, uh, I'm the last of seven. You know, there's all seven of us went to college. Yeah, right? yeah. So that was important in our, in our upbringing. So when I was picking going to college, you know, cause I was recruited by all of them. When it came down to it, my, by my senior year, I was a seven foot three high jumper. I was long jumping 25 feet. Wow. I was running 110 hurdles in 13, seven, you know, under 14 seconds. Yeah. And I was um, the third highest high jumper in my class. And you know, tied for fourth and long jump. So it was, you know, I was being recruited na nationwide from the Ivy League schools to West Point. My father thought I needed discipline. So he was like, I think you should, I think you should really consider this West Point. <laughs> I'm like, heck no. No, I don't think so. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, when, they, when I was picking colleges, it was about the, the school that was going to give me a degree that was going to yeah. hold weight into the world with whatever I was wanting to do. Yeah, and, yeah. And in conjunction with uh, me studying those professional athletes, it, I was really drawn to Ahmad Rashad mm. and um, the athlete uh, television broadcasters and, and, and that form of entertainment in the event that I didn't make it to the NFL because there was right. only 1% of, of the athletes that, you know, less than 1% come out of high school and make it pro, right? Right, So exactly. I was, my, my, my parents were really um, uh, adamant about me understanding that part of my journey. So yeah. football was just a means to an end. So in order for me to get a scholarship to go to a school, a, a dream school, I needed to play sports. And that's what I did. And so mm -hmm. um, I got the, uh, I only entertained schools of broadcast journalism uh, programs. Okay. Yeah. And that's how I landed at the University of Illinois because they were number three in the nation at, in 1999 yeah. when I was coming out. And I chose Illinois. Uh, and that as, you know, in the event that me not making it to the NFL happens, I said, hey, they found Jerry Rice and, you know, uh, Southern Mississippi Valley, you right, know, right. HBCU. If, if I'm good enough, I'll, it'll happen. And it, yeah. but if I'm not, at least I got a great education. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a huge thing that for anyone trying, thinking about being a professional athlete, going into college is, you know, trying to understand you need to have a backup plan because it's so competitive. Um, and a lot of people don't, I think, understand that, especially in high school. Yeah. And, and, and then a lot of the conversation right now was talking about paying the athletes, and that's not enough. That's not it. Right. That's yeah. not the answer either. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, short term, uh, the short term monetary gain is not the answer. It's the, yeah. it's the mentality. And we're really getting away from the point of higher education. Yeah. Or yeah. those who are gifted enough to have that or yeah. or privileged enough to have that opportunity and right. the, and, the, and the space and the time to go to higher education the the point isn't to just all of a sudden uh try to start grabbing cash and so uh, right. one of my uh, uh proposals for the ncaa is that 
it's like, how do you even uh, decide who gets paid what? Because there are performers that are generating more revenue than others. So yeah. how do you decide? Yeah. You know, who, um, and, and so is it, you know, based off of like a letter, like a letter winner, you know, you have to play X amount of snaps, then you get this slot of money, you know, you, and you, yeah. you know, for a varsity letter and the, obviously the highest slot of money would go to, you know, the quarterback or the, you know, the linebacker or the, you know, the safety or the wide receiver or the running back. Yeah. But, you know, how does that get distributed across the team? You know, yeah, does the quarterback yeah. make the same as the, you know, the third string quarterback, the starting quarterback make the same as the third string safety? Um, I think that the money should go into an escrow account and it should include uh, health care. Mm -hmm. uh, for seven years post from their last snap. Yeah, yeah. Which actually gives the uh, student athletes uh, the ability to find a secure job and which uh, health benefits would set in to where mm -hmm. they can start uh, taking benefits from their job. But I would expand that not just for football athletes because the same amount of uh, physical stress and, uh, phys and mental illness uh, plagues gymnasts, uh, wrestlers, yeah. baseball players, soccer players. So that goes across all sports. And that pool comes from uh, the revenue from the NCAA. I think it's a failed, I think it's a, a poor idea to have student athletes come to college and then start soliciting themselves outside the ranks and start trying to get sponsorships. I think that is a, just a, it's a distraction to the game. And I yeah. think that's going to uh, provide some uh, unfair advantages. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a lot of good points. I mean, it, it's just, it seems like uh, trying to find the right balance for college athletes is yeah really complex task. And there's a lot of, a lot of issues trying to figure out, okay, how do we do this the right way? Um, and yeah, I mean, especially just thinking about, you know, for all the college athletes that obviously don't go pro and don't have the opportunity for sponsorships and stuff. I think you raised a really good point about just, you know, healthcare um, and you know, all the injuries that are sustained, you know, especially for football players. I mean, you can have a guy that goes to college and just has a any hopes of uh, sort of a normal physical, you know, body being totally ruined for the rest of his life due to one injury in a game. Um, and that's, you know, there's a lot of high risk there. I mean, there's so many injuries and, and this is obviously injuries in all sorts of different college sports that can debilitate someone for the rest of their lives um, if, it, if it's bad enough. So, you know, how to, how to make, how to provide, I guess, the best future possible for people for all outcomes uh, it's such a, that's such an important thing to think about going forward. Now, as I understand, when you were in college, you had to basically make a big choice because you decided to, I guess, leave early. And I, from what I've heard that that kind of was a little bit of, of a conflict with, with your mom about that. That's right. Because uh, it really went against their teachings, which was, yeah. you know, you go to school, you go there for four years, you get that paper, you know, that no one can take away from you. And you, right. then you march out into the world and you get a job and you start a family. And, you know, it was just a very traditional upbringing. And so, yeah, we read about professional athletes. Yeah. We watched a lot of sports, but all of a sudden you, you're going to try to be one, <laughs> you know, I, you know, it was, it was probably yeah. a pretty twisted thought Yeah, at, at first, you know, but, you know, me doing all that studying and understanding, um, and I wouldn't say understanding, thinking I understood what it was like to be a professional athlete, um, going to the University of Illinois and, and then having the opportunity for players to, to go to the NFL and then remain in contact with me. And so that was, that was also very helpful. My, uh, my mentor when I was in uh, the University of Illinois was a fifth year senior. His name was Michael Dean. Okay. And he gave me his suits, you know, while he was on campus, you know, to, for award ceremony or, you know, or for, for games, he would give me his old suits. Um, he taught me how to dress. He's like, you know, 
you know, if you think you want to be a professional athlete, you need to start now and you need right. to um, start dressing nice and start, you know, every game you need to wear a suit and tie. I was kind of like, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was like it took a mentor to, to, to help me understand what I needed to uh, do to it to, to, to connect those two ends. Because I was like, yeah, I want to be a professional athlete. I've read a lot about it. And then there are professional athletes. How do I connect that dot? Right. And it took that mentor to be able to do that for me. Um, you know, playing, uh, doing the, having two back-to-back thousand-yard -back seasons was helpful. But initially, I didn't think that, you know, it was, it was a surprise to me. Uh, you know, coming off of the, uh, my first year back from having a broken leg. Yeah. And uh, being able to put up a thousand-yard season. So uh, Ron Turner calls me in his office and he says, um, uh, I, I heard you have an agent. And I was like, hell no, I would never do that. Mm -hmm. You know, that past story I told you about right. my parents. I was like, yeah, yeah. He knows, knows my parents. You know, Ron's known me since I was 16 years old. Yeah. I, like, I would never do that. Right. I, like, I would never. Are you kidding me? I was like, all right. He's like, well, scouts are, have been here looking at you at practice. And the rumor was you had an agent. And I said, no. And uh, that was only my second year on the football okay. field. Yeah. And, but I left that office and I said, oh, damn. I, I'm good enough. I didn't, you know, because that, you know, the, the whole time yeah. I was like, dude, I'm just going to college. I'm doing my best. I'm representing the university. You know, I'm running track, I'm playing on the football team, I'm holding up my obligation as a student athlete, I'm staying eligible. You know, I thought I was a Huxtable. Yeah, I'm right. like, dude, I'm going to be here for four years, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden that happened, and then, and then it really, then that dot got a little bit closer. And I said, oh, um, now I need to get serious. And so... Yeah. Um, when I chose the University of Illinois, Ron Turner promised me that I would get an internship at a major uh, news outlet. Oh, okay. By yeah. my junior year in, in the summertime. Wow. And so I wanted to, you remember the score in Chicago? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's like that, it was like the first like talk radio, like right, sports right. talk. Yeah. That's what I had my eyes on. I was like, I want to work at the score internship. Okay. <laughs> my uh, uh going into my junior year summer yeah and so he said all right chicago's a little too far because that time came up he's like so i'll send you to st louis for yeah. to fox sports net st louis oh, okay so yeah I, I did my um uh work study i was cutting up film uh not film uh uh, uh fo football sports reels baseball is covering the blues oh wow the, okay the yeah. rams yeah. And the Cardinals. <laughs> dude, it was wow. like, oh, dude, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, full spectrum uh, there almost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that, this was greatest show on turf, Marshall Folk, Court Runner. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, that's, yeah, this great oh, time. Yeah. Uh, Pujols, Pujols was in the, yeah. <laughs> oh, it was a big deal. <laughs> and so I was, you know, and this was back in doing, I was doing beta tapes and slicing beta tapes and making, right. and making reels. And I was out at a St. Louis Rams uh, a, a mini camp mm -hmm. and I got whistled over. It was Tory Holt and Isaac Bruce. Oh, wow. And I was like, uh, am I, am I going to violate, you know, any NCAA rules? And then the media was like, you have a media pass. <laughs> my, part, my partner from Fox Sports, I was like, you got a media pass. You better go out there. <laughs> and so I go walk over there. They invite yeah. me to lunch. Oh, and wow. so I, I go into lunch and I sit in the lunchroom and they close the dot. Wow. Here's how you're going to go pro. Is it, yeah. These are the drills you're going to need to do. Here's the, you know, take two hula hoops, put them to, put, they're, you know, they're larger than hula hoops. They're like for uh, doing drills, um, uh, uh, edge drills for D linemen. It's like, mm -hmm. take those enormous hoops, put them together, put, uh, two yards in between and then do these figure eights get your balance right 
Um, You need to catch uh, on the jugs machine. You need to be up to uh, over 500 balls a day. You need to be in these drills. You need to do your, you need to do drills before your workouts, do your uh, scheduled workouts and then do more drills afterwards. And so I took these, this plan back to Illinois and the, all the receivers were like, all right. It's like, where'd you get this? And I was like, Tori Holt and Isaac Bruce told me to do this. And we fell in line and we just, we executed on that. And wow. That, you know, that was, that's, what, that's what I brought back my final year of the, at the University of Illinois. And that, that was like, that's when I knew that I could do it, make it to the NFL. It wasn't any time before that. Yeah. Well, I mean, talk about just a, a great experience too, though, and if you, in your position at the time to be able to you know hang out with a couple of wide receivers that are you know stars in the league, and then you know just learn from them and talk to them. I mean, that's great. That, and they were my size, and yeah, I, I had yeah. been patterning my game after them, and it was it was like it was just serendipitous. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, because I I didn't know I didn't know what I was missing. Right. And right. then and and for them to say, oh yeah, we've been watching you. Yeah. Here's what you need to do it was like whoa yeah <laughs> it, you know the clouds opened up for me yeah that's a and... perfect situation yeah <laughs> Jeez. yeah i mean talk about a, a great internship <laughs> right <laughs> it's like more more athletes should try to replicate that get internships around the sports world you know broadcasting or whatever because if you can meet pro athletes before going pro you know that could be the the extra push, you know, to help get you there. So, wow. Oh, that's really that, good. Yeah, that's interesting. That's cool. So when you first get to the NFL and you get drafted, how much pressure was there initially? Hmm. <laughs> a lot, a lot of pressure. Yeah. The, so... Um, imagine the disappointment, you know, the, I'm expected to be a first or second round pick latest first day, third round pick first day goes by not selected, not even a call. And so this whole idea that I've passed off to my parents that, you know, I'm going to go to the NFL and I'm going to make it to the NFL, um, that was a that was a, a a rough start. Yeah, yeah. The the and I say that the only person satisfied in the NFL draft is the first overall pick. Yeah. Everyone else thinks they should have been drafted higher. Right. <laughs> so yeah. so no. you know the uh, and I threw a major temper tantrum. Uh, after that first day went by and then the second day went by and it was, you know, and it wasn't until, you know, 11, 12 o'clock central time when I even got a call. Wow. Yeah. And, and uh, Dennis Erickson called um, uh, uh, Mr. Donahue from the GM at the time. And they said that they were going to draft me to San Francisco. And so I, I came into that situation with a, a, a big chip on my shoulder. Yeah, yeah. So I felt I had something to prove. And which was, it was, a, it was definitely a good thing for me because it was, I was always on edge. I didn't know if I was going to make the team. You know, the second right. day picks are the guys who are going to get cut. Yeah, uh, the first round picks, you know, who or who they're keeping. I was going on the team with uh, Terrell Owens as the starting receiver. Uh, Ty Streets was the uh, ex receiver who I was backing up. Uh, Cedric Wilson, who was a, a, a just a technician of a route runner, uh, who uh, came out of the University of Tennessee. Um, just you know, a real hardcore, like blue collar working guy. And then it was me. They brought in Arnez Battle from Notre Dame. Okay. And they were switching him to receiver, you know, to, to be like that uh, Antoine randall L. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, style, style player. And 
it was a, the it was a lot of pressure because just personally i had left school early yeah so yeah personally it was like all right i made a decision and now it seems like a crappy one because i'm not the first round pick uh that they thought i was going to be and then um in my own head i was thinking the same thing yeah so yeah yeah there, there was a lot of pressure yeah that's I think that's yeah, probably one of the biggest fears for a lot of people when they're declaring for the draft is probably not going as high as you hoped, then wondering, okay, should I have stayed an extra year or something? Um, yeah, and I knew for me staying an extra year wasn't going to be feasible because I, I was already getting double teamed. Oh, okay. Um, and, and, yeah. I was, and, I was, and I had uh, Walter Young, Aaron Moorhead, and Greg Lewis, and they were just fantastic wide receivers. And I was, yeah. I was getting double teamed. So yeah. it was tough for me to, it was tough for me to, to get a thousand yards. Right. So you're coming conditions. off your great year and you just want to go make most of it. Yeah. And then this was the first year without Kurt Kittner uh, mm -hmm. at the university of Illinois. And I still squeaked out a thousand yards. Yeah. And it, it was difficult. It was difficult. And yeah. And then, those three wide receivers were all leaving. Their, their eligibility was up. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on the talent that I saw coming into the University of Illinois and the talent at the quarterback position, I was not coming back. So yeah. uh, for me, it, was, it wasn't even a, a thought. So I was like, I was only going pro. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and then so I could try to get that past my parents. Like, I'm not going to be able to uh, be as good on the football field. But wait. You ain't there to play football anyway. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're right. But <laughs> like it, that wasn't going to go over well. So it was right. just like, you know what? I'm going pro. That's yeah. the decision. And, and so uh, a large part of me was saying, I got to roll with it. Yeah. And no matter where I go, I got to roll with this. And so getting into San Francisco, the other form of the pressure, the other part of the pressure was the pressure the older the veterans put on the rookies. Yeah, yeah. And, What's that like? And, and these were established veterans. T.O. was in his eighth, you know, eighth, seventh or eighth year. Jeff Garcia, yep. veteran. The, the, the lineman, uh, uh, Derek Deese, perennial uh, all-pro left tackle. Ron yeah. Stone, perennial all pro uh, guard, Scott Gregg, I mean, Jeremy Newberry. These dudes were hardcore uh, NFL veterans from the old era. Yeah. You know, they were groomed from the 80s era. Yeah. And, and these were like 90s hardcore NFL pros. And uh, Brian, Brian Young was on that team. And so it was there was a lot of old traditions that needed to uh, go away. Okay. Yeah. And then there was a lot of traditions that were unique to the NFL experience. And part of that was the pressure to perform. Mm -hmm. uh, I finished my first season with, you know, maybe, you know, 300 yards or whatever. Right. <laughs> you know, um, a few spectacular plays. And then my second year, um, uh, Jeremy Newberry says to me, the you know Pro, Pro Bowl center, he's like, you know, you know, NFL wide receivers, you know, guys can get that in one game. You know that, right? So you went a whole season and you got that. That's like a game and wow. a half for most guys. Okay. Yeah. And this was my second year in the NF in the NFL, and they had traded away Terrell Owens. They got they had traded away Ty Streets, and now I'm starting receiver. So, yeah. you know, it's like, so a lot of that grooming uh, my first year was preparing me for a, a career in the NFL. But uh, being behind uh, Terrell Owens was a horrible example of how to be a pro. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, well, that was another, I imagine, what that was, was just that? another yeah. part of the pressure where it's just like, like, what am I looking at? Like, is this really, is, is he really calling the starting quarterback a homosexual oh yeah in the, oh my in the media gosh. is this guy really cussing out the 
offensive coordinator up and down the sideline. Did this is this guy really not practicing this week? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was just like, whoa. Yeah. Like, is this guy really disrespecting team treating teammates like they're like measly fans? Is this really happening? And and this is what it means to be a professional athlete. And I, and I was like, this was kind of it was matching up with a lot of the things that I had read. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> about the tough times, you know, with the, the Dallas Cowboys and, you know, the, the White House era yep. and Mike Tyson and, you know, Agassi. It was like a lot of yeah. the um, uh, microcosms of, you know, the negative stereotypes of professional athletes all in one situation. And, yeah. and so it's like to deprogram myself from that, that also took a lot of pressure. Yeah, I can't imagine what that was like. I mean, I, I know that yeah, T.O. has uh, a pretty big reputation for, for having lots of interesting things happen on his teams. But uh, yeah, to be behind him as a wide receiver, I'm sure that was, that was kind of an experience that not many people know what it's like who are on other right. teams. And then, yeah. and then it was also this whole other aspect of it where the work ethic was just out of this world. And, and and so I would have to pluck and and create my own professional athlete. So you know I was looking at Cedric Wilson. And he had this he had this wiggle where he yeah. would, he could uh, get it off the line of scrimmage and he played really low. He lowered his center of gravity and he sunk his hips when he went in and out of cuts. I was like, oh, I I'll use that. Yeah. Uh, Ty Streets had these uh, shake moves at the top of his route to make a receiver to make the defender think he was going one way and he goes the other. I'll take that. Um, a, a Terrell once got on me one time. He's like, "Man, just grab the guy and just throw him out the way." I'm 173 pounds. Right. <laughs> my rookie yeah. year. Yeah. You know, he's 225. Yeah. Terrell Owens is a 225. big guy. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. I was like, "Look at him!" Like, all right, you know, I'm not gonna say anything. I was like, "Sure." Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. happening but yeah. the the way he trained on the field it was second and not I I couldn't I was I couldn't believe my eyes and then when he like when he practiced mm -hmm. you know it would you know he would work out with these workout bands on his waist and legs that restricted his that was like resistance bands and he'd go up against defenders with these resistance bands on oh my gosh he would, you know, he had personal trainer and, you know, his meal regimen was just spot on. And so I was like, oh, all right. Like, that's what it takes. So it's to kind of pluck that from uh, yeah. his regimen in order to build myself as a player. Yeah. So I guess it's really about when you're coming in as a, as a rookie, picking and choosing which aspects of your game you want to mimic from other players and obviously Tara Owens in terms of, of a player, I mean, an incredible player. So if you could take extract the, those really good elements of his skill set into your game. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a probably a good thing to have. Um, now, when did you first feel really comfortable as a pro? Like you felt like, okay, I belong here. I know that, you know, I, I can make this work. In uh, 2008, when I was in Chicago, okay. the, um, you know, my, my first three years, it was still really difficult to kind of, to catch because it was, because it's so tight. The, the, I, the separation, I couldn't get as much separation. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, and, you know, on the proverbial game, slowing down hadn't quite happened yet. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that happens around five or six, year five or six is when, right. I think I, well, I feel like the game slows down for a player, but so it was difficult uh, being in the situations, and then the level of competition was just so high. The and then the offensive coordination wasn't it didn't really fit my style. So the it wasn't until I got to Chicago with uh, Kyle Orton mm -hmm. and that was like the first time I was with a quarterback who could throw all the throws the deep ones that I was really good at uh, the short ones he had really good accuracy 
he, he liked to throw a ball a lot. And the, the, and I was back with Ron Turner. So I was doing a lot of the, the, yeah. the, the big top posts, the double moves, the big out, the big, big comebacks that I was really good at selling the, selling the go route and uh, breaking out at 18 on the sideline and Kyle could deliver those throws. The, um, and that's when I felt, I was kind of like, oh, all right. Like now I get it. I, you know, the, my coordination uh, was starting to match up with my athletic ability. And, and that's when I felt the most comfortable. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. I mean, I think a big part of being successful as a pro athlete is probably connected a lot to also just being in the right situation because there's, you know, so many players that might fit one system but not fit another, and then, you know, their talent gets kind of wasted in one system. And so, boom, they change teams and have a breakout year all of a sudden. It's, you know, always – it's there's so many factors at play, and you're always trying to find that right fit. Um, and you see that just in sports all the time. Yeah, and, and, and then there's a code in, yeah. in sports. So, as a player, you know, I just had to take it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, um, you know, and – the you know in the news with um, Naomi Osaka talking about the mental health aspect of of sports, you know that's the most uh, difficult part of it. Is uh, I'm aware of what's going on on the team. I'm I'm aware of the work ethics of the coaching staff also, and yet I still have to, I had to answer questions to the media about my performance. Right. And why I'm not performing. And that's not the story. Yeah, right. And so, uh, so uh, that's why I had uh, such an embattled relationship with the media. Yeah. Um, it was because it was like, that's not the story. Yeah, <laughs> uh, right, yeah. We're not, we're not uh, going into these interviews talking about how I'm being double teamed as a second year, fourth round pick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. I, sh I shouldn't be getting double teamed. And how come no one else is open? <laughs> yeah. like, where are the plays to get anybody else open? Right. And, and, and that was the, uh, the mentally challenging part about playing in the NFL is the code. And mm -hmm. once you talk about, you know, I, I recall a, a play in San Francisco with, you know, and this player was the third or fourth string quarterback. And somehow he's in the game in San Francisco. You know, every year I played with like four quarterbacks. And uh, we were running a, a slant and go. It was even more moves than that. It was a, it was a, a slant, fake post and go. And okay. on the goal line. It was ridiculous. Yeah. And so I'm on the slant, fake post and he throws the ball and then I'm and I'm as I'm breaking out to the uh out the the back pylon and then the question from the media were well why didn't you go get the ball it's because you're not tough enough is it because you don't want to go over the middle is it you know and and it's these questions Jeez. and and I said no the ball was thrown too soon I had another move to go mm -hmm. and that was the headline Brandon throws the quarterback under the bus Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, that's, yeah. And, that's an and unfortunate, just... unfortunate thing I've, I've seen a lot too, is just because they want to oversimplify every situation because I think they, a lot of it's about selling headlines and keeping people interested in reading um, and, and probably talking about the complexities of team sports and why, you know, it's, it's, you're not necessarily get the performances out of certain players as you will. Uh, due to, you know, whatever reason, that's not as interesting as just, you know, having some blanket statement about, okay, why something's happening, uh, it seems like. And uh, I think that's also kind of a, a problem sometimes with some fans, too, who are, you know, very vocal and critical uh, of players uh, just because they, they want to simplify it. And, you know, when these people, everyone's just human beings playing, you know, <laughs> playing the game, you know, it's not, there's, there's a lot more to it than just, you uh, just like, oh, this person is just not very good or, or whatever. It's, there's a lot of factors there, so. That's right.
Yeah, that, that makes sense. But so in, in, in 2010, though, that's when you, you know, really exploded onto the scene because you had a humongous year. I mean, it was incredible. Um, talk about what that was like. Yeah, the uh, 2000, uh, that 2008 bear season, I uh, tore my PCL. Okay. And, and I was, I was pretty much written off, you know, especially coming off, off of the, my time at the Washington football team and not getting along with the media and uh, Joe Gibbs there. They uh, attempted to blackball me from the NFL. And then Ron Turner actually uh, vouched for me with Lovey Smith and the Chicago mm -hmm. Bears organization to give me another shot. I come back um, doing a decent job of getting along with people and I tore my knee. And so uh, I actually thought I was done. I was, you know, going to uh, pick up at the Big Ten Network, you know, mm -hmm. finish my undergraduate, uh, pick up at the Big Ten Network and start my journalism career. And I got a call from Kyle Orton. He's like, hey, I'm out in Denver. I told Josh McDaniels about you. Um, uh, you think you'd be interested in coming out for a workout? And I said, I would. He's like, all right, I'll see what I, I see. What, he asked me what kind of shape I'm in. I was in this weird shape because uh, I was still living in um, Lake Forest, Illinois. So I was, uh, I was Olympic lifting with my dentist. <laughs> what? He's a, he's a, he's a um, uh, amateur uh, triathlete. Okay. Uh, this big Russian Jewish man, big okay. old trunk, big old legs. And, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, just awesome, gloriously huge man. And his yeah. uh, weight trainer, um, uh, I was playing basketball uh, with DJ Skip uh, okay. <laughs> with the hip hop community on the, uh, yeah. on the south side of Chicago in the, in the rec center <laughs> on, <laughs> uh, on, um, uh, Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah. After my leg day with uh, Yuri, my dentist. Yeah. And then I was rock climbing with uh, these uh, restaurant owners in my neighborhood in uh, wow. Lake Forest on wow. uh, on Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday. <laughs> Sounds like kind of a conditioning routine of like Rocky or something for the movies. <laughs> this random <Right>. stuff. <laughs> oh, it was just so random. And, it was, you know, and that rock climbing was like rock climbing and eating a charcuterie plate and drinking wine at the same time. <laughs> Picture that. And Kyle's like, what kind of shape are you in? I'm like, man, I'm in decent shape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, define, define conditioning. Well, it's a <laughs> so, so I actually came out to Denver and, and lit up the workout. Awesome. Okay, so it worked. It, 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 was, it was bizarre. It was yeah. really bizarre. I, I got out there and it was just like, woo. And, jo and, there, and uh, Josh McGowns was kind of like, uh, we weren't expecting to see that. And um, we, we, we want, they were trying to sign me. And they were like, and my agent was like, no, you got to get out of there. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll do yeah. the negotiations. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and so that's how I ended up in uh, Denver in 2009. But then it was, um, uh, they had uh, Brandon Marshall, uh, Stokely, Jabbar Gaffney, and a fan favorite, Eddie Royal, all ahead of me. Yeah. So yeah. I was coming in as a, a, a safety valve, uh, insurance policy. Right. Uh, in the event that one of them get in, gets injured. You, yeah. People always get injured in the NFL, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. They didn't. Wow. Yeah, they, that's a lot. All here. four remained remarkably healthy the yeah. entire year. And it wasn't till the end of the year uh, when uh, three of the players faked injuries. What? Yeah, because they didn't want to ruin their chances for next season because we were, we were we such okay. a bad team. You yeah. know, that was the year the Broncos started off like six or seven and out. Okay. Yeah. Beat the Patriots. You remember that year? And Josh was like running yeah. around the stadium. Right, right. Yeah. There's a year they wore those ugly yellow uniforms <laughs> and the brown yeah. and yellow uniforms. And um, three of the player wide receivers faked injuries because they didn't want to oh, ruin their uh, prospects for next year. Going to get new contracts. or And so um, one of the players said to me, he's like, you know, I was like, oh, man, it's like that just kind of goes against, uh, you know, what it's like to be an NFL player. He's like, man, what are you talking about? You should thank me. You're, you're going to play. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, I told that particular player, I was like, but the problem is, it's like, I'm not going to come out. If I go in, I ain't coming out. And <laughs> sure enough, I went into those last two games and like lit it up. Boom, boom. Yeah. And the team uh, traded away Marshall. Yeah. They um, uh, made a, a few roster adjustments. And then I was a starting wide receiver going into 2010. Wow. And uh, Josh told me going into that season, he was like, he was like, do you remember I ran your pro day? And I was like, no. He's like, yeah, I ran your pro day at the University of Illinois. And he's like, you know, he's like, uh, Bill just wouldn't sign you. He's like, I was trying to get you drafted to the uh, Patriots and he wouldn't sign you. He said, so if you can do play anywhere remotely close to the way you were playing in that pro day, you'll be all pro in this offense. Wow. And I was like, dude, I was like, that was like nine years ago, eight years ago. Or yeah, yeah. This. Saying that in my mind, but to him, I said, you got it. He's like, I said, I won't let you down. Wow. Yeah, then you just kind of exploded on from there. Yeah, I mean. yeah it was ridiculous. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was, it was like finally playing the cerebral football game that I always wanted to play. Yeah. You know, the, the game was slow. Uh, I knew a lot about the X's and O's. Uh, I could, you know, look up and read the coverages pre-snap, which was necessary in uh, Josh McDaniel's offense, that the quarterback and the receivers are all seeing the same thing. Yeah. And uh, uh, I was back with Kyle Orton, who liked throwing me the ball. Yep. Uh, who could throw deep balls. And we could do big old, big top play actions and go huge down the field. And he liked throwing it. He wasn't afraid to throw it and throw interceptions. And yeah, it was, a, you know, it was, a, you know, the perfect time where, um, you know, my effort, you know, an opportunity meet. Yeah, definitely. Because I've always been an effort person, you know, diving for the ball, um, you know, going up with one hand, you know, doing, I do anything to catch the ball. I'd rather dive and catch the ball and fall down than to not catch the ball at all. Right. And, right. Uh, and so it's like to be able to finally put that on display and become the player that, you know, you know, everybody knew I could be, it was humbling experience. It was like, yes. It's like all the neat things that, you know, I'd studied as a child about being a professional athlete, the, um, to be able to do all those moves and have like the skill to do all the moves that I wanted it to do, to have a coach that believed in my talent, who needed those yards out of me in order for us to like have any chance of winning and a quarterback who believed in me, it was just like, it was a humbling experience. And then the other component was that um, the, the Denver market, the, um, the fan base, uh, was is non intrusive. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the media gave me space and um, uh, allowed me to be myself. You know, I could talk to the media or I could not talk to the media. It, was right, like, it wasn't an right. uh, ordeal. They weren't um, uh, making big deals out of any of the antics that happened on the field or any rumors that were circulating around the team. It was just. Um, a, a sports oriented franchise and I could just focus on playing sports. That was until Tim Tebow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Tim, Tim uh, coming on the scene was an interesting experience. Uh, uh, and I was just like super frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that <laughs> I I remember that Broncos team pretty well. Because I remember you had a, a huge season. And I was excited about that because that was also around the time I had already, I I'd met you a little bit at a game and stuff. I was like, oh, wow, Brandon Lloyd is great, is great and stuff. And I think I also met Tim Tebow, actually. That might have been that same same time or whatever. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, Tim, from the outside perspective, yeah, Tim seems like a, a super nice guy, but yeah, definitely he seemed to struggle with adjusting to the NFL game. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a lot of, there's, there, there's a lot. Um, he was unable to pick up um, from a cerebral aspect of, of the game and then physical limitations, uh, mm -hmm. just mechanics and height and, yeah. you know, 
I remember overall intangibles about being a, a, a NFL quarterback. Yeah. You know, with the film room and then the intelligence on the field and then uh, to be able to physically perform it, mm-hmm. you have to you have to be really sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a really strange for that the team that he was in the playoffs with. Were you on that team, the the Broncos team that went to playoffs? Are you it left that year? Yeah, I was in St. Okay. Louis. That was that 2011, 2012. Yeah, was, yeah I guess it was like 2011. Yeah, I was in St. Louis that year. Yeah, because I was one of the strangest teams I've ever seen in my entire life. But yeah, like they're I think they beat the Steelers in the playoffs and like Tebow threw, I don't know, complete, I don't, he didn't complete very many passes, but he completed like all the passes he completed were touchdowns that were just, just bombs to some wide receiver. I think it was like, uh, I can't remember who the receiver was like Thomas, uh, Thomas. Yeah. It's Mary's Thomas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I was just, it was just so, so wild to watch, but, uh, yeah, never know what's going to happen in, in the NFL, I guess. So, but, and then, so you ended up, going to a few different teams and you also played with Tom Brady for a little while. What was that like? Oh, yes. Yes. So the 2011 season, you know, Josh and Daniels got fired for, you know, recording teams or yeah. In the European game, the international game in London. Yeah. He got picked up in St. Louis. And, um, and that was when, uh, Elway, uh, took over the team and, uh, you know, I uh, ended up requesting a trade and was fortunate enough to be able to get to St. Louis to continue to run the offense. And, and you know, 730 yards or something ridiculous in 11 games. Yeah. And it was really fun to be back in Missouri and, and play, especially not in Kansas City, where I feel like there would have been a lot of distraction. But to play in St. Louis, yeah, um, almost, you know, full circle where – uh, Tory Holt and Isaac Bruce set me down in that lunchroom and uh, to be able to continue my career and be you know playing at that Isaac Bruce Tory Holt level I was like I felt it was yeah it's like I felt it was, it was like it was a badge of honor I felt really yeah. legit yeah, to that's be able cool. to do that um, yeah. in that uniform uh, in St. Louis like Tory Holt and Isaac Bruce um, uh Steve Spagnuolo was a fantastic man. He was the head coach at the time. And then to bump into Steven Jackson, who was an all-time favorite teammate, all-time, all-time, yeah. great. Uh, everything, checked all the boxes. Highest paid, best work ethic, first in, last out. Uh, worked out extra hard, super fly, all his clothes are tailored. <laughs> you know, the dude's like legit, yeah. full circle. It's like, all yeah. right, bro. I, this is a great, uh, fantastic teammate and friend. And uh, so I was able to finish out the Denver contract and become a free agent and was able to follow Josh to New England. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and play with Tom. Yeah. So, uh, I th- you know, Tom was that same thing. Stephen Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Highest pay. <laughs> Hardest <Yeah>. work. <laughs> yeah. First in. <laughs> yeah. Last out. <laughs> you know, like everything just legit Tom. And, and hella fly. The flyest, the flyest man on earth. <laughs> I mean, everything. Everything is fly. Yeah. And. And that was what was really neat about Tom. You know, it was like, you know, come in the locker room. He like, give me a hug in the morning. What's up, B. Lloyd? How was your night last night? What'd you do? It's like, oh, you know, I watched Netflix. Oh, word. Like, all right. You know, cool. It's like, it's like this real like one-on-one connection. Yeah. yeah. And then get on the football field and he hits the switch. Motherfucker. <laughs> oh, this, and it's just like, whoa. It's like the intensity yeah. just turns on. It's like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now this is fun. It was like, really exciting to play with him. To, like, yeah. to go to like, have those two sides. I like that. Like that's, that's, yeah. That was something yeah. that I really admired about him, to be able to get on the field and just be strictly business. Get into the uh, film room, strictly business. And then um, go off the field and be like, 
you know, what's up, B. Lloyd? You know, you want to come over and watch Monday Night Football with me and G tonight? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah I guess so he's just an absolutely yeah. amazing friend. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, and just admirable to watch. You know, it's like yeah. there's certain players in sports who I define as playing the game for other reasons. Mm-hmm. They're not, you know, most of us are out there, you know, to make some money. Yeah. Some of us out there because we can. Some of us out here because luck. Yeah. And then there's players out there that are just not doing it for the same reasons. And those are those Hall of Famers where it's just mm-hmm. like, whoa, like the, the stats, the um, uh, playing against the greats, where yeah. like, this game that is playing in front of us, this is not the real game. It's the Joe Montana game. Yeah. It's then the Tom Brady game that he's trying to stretch these stats out. So it's going to take so long for another player to reach these right. stats. It's it's an it's it's admirable to look at. It's it's an honor to be a part of, mm-hmm. and to play with that. And um, one of the things uh, I'll say about Tom was, uh, you know, Tom would say, you know, in this uh, red zone situation, uh, seven years ago, this defensive coordinator ran this coverage against me. So I want you to when I give you a head nod, I want you to run a fade. Now, if I look at you and stare, that means nothing. But if I put my left foot back, I want you to do a one-step slant. Wow. So he had this backyard game yeah. going yeah. underneath the offense with all the pass catchers. That's, that's amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it just – it took – um, it just, it took the game to another level of yeah. being able to get open and make plays and be there when, when he called my number, I was always like, I was saying to myself, like, I got to get so wide open because I don't know if he's going to call my number. I don't know yeah. when he does. And when he does, I need to make sure I'm ready. Yeah. So it's like yeah. that intensity, every play, it was really fun. It was really yeah. fun. And, yeah, and then playing in the yeah. Boston market and then and playing and, and, and it was like, it, it was primo. It, it was yeah. fun. The, the, the professional athlete treatment there, mm-hmm. you know, it's like what you talk about. It's like, you know, like being a Yankee or being, you know, right. being a, 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 a Laker. Yeah. It's like being yeah, a Patriot. A... It was like, phew, you go place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, um, I, I remember deal. I was in Boston and I was like, I was just floating around by myself. Uh, cause it was just a dream come true to get to the city. I'd never been in the new England area. So I just wanted to explore yeah. the town. So I was just floating around. I was buying tickets uh, to concerts. I, I love going to music venues. Yeah, so yeah. I was buying tickets to the house of blues and in, in Boston, I was just doing it online. Mm-hmm. And I, and I kind of stand in will call, you know, I'd be dressed incognito and, you know, I'd be standing in will call. And I checked into this, uh, to the, the weekend concert. And okay. Yeah. The, the, the guy's like, he looked at my name. He's like, all right. He's like, come, come in here and then stand over here in the corner over here. So just inside the door. Yeah. He's like, wait here. The general manager of the House of Blues comes down and goes, he goes, Brandon Lloyd, here's my number. Don't ever buy tickets <laughs> and stand in will call ever again here. <laughs> 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 like took me backstage and it was like, yeah. <laughs> it's like dude. Ah, wow. So it was, it was just really neat. The the chefs, the 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 culinary experience is already top notch in Boston. But then, you know, uh, being a player, it's just like the chefs come out and greet and the the wow. whole experience. It makes you really want to play hard for that uh, for that city and that fan base. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I guess that's the yeah. You were right there at the time where like yeah, the Patriots were dominating for years and. Yeah, you know, to be a patriot, obviously, is probably like the biggest thing you could be in the NFL. So, um, it's a, that's a cool experience. I mean, it sounds like you've had actually an incredible amount of interesting experiences and in meeting different players and playing with different people. 
Um, I mean, that's like a treasure trove of just stories I bet you have um, with all the people that you met, which is really cool. Um, and of course, having you know, such a great career yourself. So what, when did you decide that, okay, it was time to, to retire and move on? The, the, you know, being in the locker room with uh, Aaron Hernandez in uh, New England, that was a traumatic experience. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, bet. Um, I took a year off after that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'd hit my goal. I always said I wanted to play 10 years in the NFL, you know, be vested. I feel like if I could got to 10 years, then I, you know, would have had an opportunity at a Super Bowl, which I did. You know, I went to New England strictly for that. You know, like you said, that's where you go to get a Super Bowl. Right. So, like, that was my effort. <clears throat> you know, I, I got to, you know, got to Chicago the year after they went, you know, to the Super Bowl. So, I was, like, thinking, I'm, you know, I was doing my best to get on Super Bowl teams. Yeah. And um, that experience in New England, that was traumatic. Yeah, uh, I uh, took a year off. Um, you know, I had already been working in the uh, in aerospace sales in the off season since I got to Denver. Yeah, yeah. I'd already been thinking about and planning for uh, post career, and I knew I wanted to get in business. I wasn't going to remain in in uh, in hip hop and music, but I wanted to uh, be more in, in the corporate space. So a close friend of mine had. Uh, brought me in in uh, 2010 um, with the pr uh, proposition. He says, come work for me in the off seasons. I'll give you a leave of absence to play in the NFL. Okay. And, and so I was able to manage, you know, his sexiest accounts. He actually gave me the Boeing account. He Ooh, gave wow. me uh, the SpaceX account. He gave me the subcontractors for the F-35 project. Uh, yeah. He, I got to do the, um, the, the international travel the, with the uh, Japanese uh, uh, steel mill. Mm -hmm. uh, I was part of a, a project where we uh, were rolling steel in Japan. So I got to have that whole wow. experience in the off seasons. And that was my introduction into the business world. And so I, I went back to that full time uh, in uh, that 2013 year. Mm -hmm. And uh I, I wanted to put some distance between myself and the, the, the NFL. I thought that it would be, you know, I hit my goal. I hit my professional goal. I tried as hard as I could to get a championship and I was actually ready to return to normalcy. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, deprogramming myself to get back to some sense of normalcy. Sure. And, and it was, and everything was fine. It was a tough adjustment. It was profound loss. It's horrible. Uh, to lose that identity that I had since the third grade. Mm -hmm. And um, and I got a call from um, my music manager. He says, I ran into the, the general manager of the 49ers at a cocktail party uh, last weekend. I'm sorry, man. I, and and I, I, I need to apologize. I was like, dude, why? What are you talking about? He's like, well... I told them that they're missing you. They need you back. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm fine doing what I'm doing. He's like, no, man. He's like, you need to come back. And so I called the general manager. He asked me, what kind of shape are you in? Okay. <laughs> That's right. Here we go again. <laughs> I said, well, I got a country club membership. You know, I'm playing tennis. <laughs> <laughs> I rock five Golfing. sometimes. So. No, I, yeah, I'm, I, I'm playing tennis. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a three five plus. Uh, so I'm playing in the tennis league <laughs> indoors. Uh, I'm, I, I golf weekly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so... Um, uh, Jim Harbaugh actually gives me a call and he gives me, I mean, he's a hell of a recruiter. I don't know if yeah. you've heard these stories. Yeah, yeah. From what I've heard, it, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Oh, man, it was, it was impressive. Yeah. It was impressive. The, um, the way he really talked up that organization, talked up 
um, you know, you know, he's like, you know, we're the we're the New England of the New England Patriots of the NFC West, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, the organization, the new stadium, the the pep talk, you know, come back, finish where you started, you know, you know, you, you, it'll help you in your business career, you know, being aligned with champions, you know, we're going back to the Super Bowl, you know, we're, we're going to win it. It was like, it was really solid. So it was, uh, again, I was like, all right, I can come back and uh, make a run at the Super Bowl. And that was just far from the case. It got on the team and the team was imploding. Uh, around uh, Colin Kaepernick and uh, the expiring contracts. So a lot of these players who had got that pep talk four years ago and experienced that success were now all at the table ready for their contracts. And uh, he, you know, the organization made a mistake and and gave the money to Colin Kaepernick. Mm. And that was, uh, it unsettled the locker room and uh, Harbaugh, left and yeah for a 50 million dollar contract to go to michigan and kind of left yeah. that team in disarray right sure and so oh after that year it was like all right i'm yeah. good on that yeah. <laughs> i was like yeah. you know I, I tried you know I, yeah. I tried and you know and i didn't i didn't mind you know coming back and 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 being in the and being in a role where i could mentor players sure yeah that happened to me uh, my second year, they brought in Curtis Conway to mm-hmm. uh, mentor me. Profound experience. It's like, you know, an apprenticeship. Yeah. And how these pros talk about what it's like to be a pro. It's like these reinforcing elements of being a professional athlete was like phew, solid. My third year, they brought in Johnny Morton. Phew, mm-hmm. Same thing. You know, taught me how to break down the game. You know, every game you need to consider, you know, think about you want to get, you know, uh, 50 to 70 yards a game. This is how you need right. to break down these games. And, you know, each catch you make, you make a spectacular catch, poof, it's a million dollars right there. So it's kind of like, yep. ooh, ooh. I was like, all right. So I was like, he really helped me like compartmentalize the game and then uh, start performing. And um, so I didn't mind being in that role, you know, because I, I had that role when I went to St. Louis and you know, and Amendola was injured. I, you know, I wish I would have got a chance to mentor him, but he was around a lot and he was rec- always mm-hmm. talking to me. He was always, even though yeah. he was injured, he was always like around me. And I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed yeah. having someone like that because that's the way I was. I was right. around uh, Tur- Turo Owens and he would be like, get the hell away from me. <laughs> I was around him so much because I was just trying to pick up anything. Right, right. Even if I, I just want to hear a side conversation of how Ty Streets was getting open. Dude, they would be like, get away. I was the annoying little brother. <laughs> but these old school cats wouldn't talk to me. Yeah. And so that was one thing I learned when I got older. I talked to the younger players. So yeah. Even yeah. in Denver, and they brought in uh, Demaris Thomas and Eric Decker. If I couldn't, they weren't going to he- listen to me because it was different personalities they weren't that type of player right but they were going to watch me so I made sure I was doing those work ethic pieces that I picked up from uh Owens yeah and Cedric Wilson I was applying them in Denver so if they didn't hear me talk they knew what to do they knew right to be a baller and so um I I love those roles and in New England uh it was neat to uh, be that for Julian Edelman you know it's like Mm -hmm. Here's what it's like to be a baller. Like, yeah. this is how to, you know, obviously he was his in his own right. But um, I know I dropped some jewels for him to uh, pick up and build his career off. But pluck from me, you know, pluck yeah. from players. And so I didn't mind doing that. But the, the, the toughest part was it wasn't worth the money anymore. It's too dangerous mm-hmm. to play the, in the NFL for less than a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. It's too dangerous. Yeah, I- yeah, it's it's like it's too dangerous. It was too dangerous for me to play for less than three million dollars. It's not worth it. Yeah, with all the injuries that that happen, I mean, it's you know they can ruin your life if if you're not careful. So I <laughs> totally understand that. That's it's scary. I mean, like, yeah, I 
I was never a big guy, so I never played football. I played a lot of soccer. I played some hockey and, and baseball and basketball. But yeah, I from a young age, I always kind of felt like I'm not sure if I want to <laughs> want to play uh, football since it was just I, I was always saw like people I I was friends with a lot of people who played and did see them get injured, you know, and um, some really bad stuff. It's like wow, I don't know if I want to want to do that. So. Yeah, it was, you know, and it's that, and then, you know, obviously that code of, you know, going on another team and then pretending like there's a receiver competition. Yeah. That, that was like really uh, old when, you know, when there really wasn't, you know, they're just wanting to play younger players, you know, yeah. and it's like the business model just is not conducive for veteran players. Yeah. Uh, there's too many new players coming in, cheap players. Yeah, and sure, and and so they can cycle through those guys versus a guaranteed contract. Um, uh, for me, uh, as a, a ten year plus guy, it just it doesn't make sense to have a guy that is guaranteed one million dollars off the salary. You know, taking one million dollars from right. the salary cap when you can have three or four players. You know, yeah, in different positions, and you can cut and release them and bring them back and forth and fill. Um, holes where there, where it's needed throughout the year. So, um, those are those are a couple of the factors. The other factors were um, there's just not that many winning teams. Mm -hmm. There's uh, you know I didn't want to play for the sake of playing. I was only playing to be on winning teams. Right. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And you know it was like that was the whole point. And you, you know I would you know, have considered uh, New Orleans or Green Bay, but, you know, those just weren't programs. Those programs weren't um, seeking out my services. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try to get with yeah. Breeze or try to get with Rodgers. I mean, that would be like the, you know, last two great quarterbacks that were around. You know, yeah. Um, not that there weren't other great quarterbacks. Right, last right. Two, uh, older great quarterbacks that could use older talent because you know the younger guys they were grooming their own sets of sure. receivers. You know, like, you know Russell Wilson and right uh, those type players. But um, but yeah, th those are the, those are the factors that factored in. So when people ask me why I left the NFL, I just say old age. Yeah, well, I mean, like obviously because as you've mentioned several times, there's there's so many so much of your health is on the line playing. You know, if you're not a young player trying to get established, you want if you're going to risk, you know, your your health, you want to risk it for a team that has a chance at winning uh, the Super Bowl. So that's that's obviously a big part of it. That's cool, though, that you also mentioned about how you really try to help those younger guys any way you can because giving back to other people's careers can obviously you can make a huge impact on people um, doing that. So that's really great. Um, what advice do you have to sort of young athletes of really any sports that are considering a professional career? Um, study. Study uh, what makes a professional athlete. Study the current events that are happening with professional athletes. Uh, you know, this that was my blueprint. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, for example, I read in Sports Illustrated uh, in the 90s after, you know, the was it the Cowboys three-peat or whatever, uh, 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 Super Bowl championships, that Emma Smith had trouble uh, going to the, the public spaces, to the movies. So he had to like bring a movie theater into his house in Dallas and his yeah. life was miserable because of that. Yeah. So um, those were some of the components where uh, I maintained a lower profile uh, as a professional athlete. And so that I could blend in to certain yeah. circum to, to normal life, I wanted to maintain a normal life. And um, so it's like study up on uh, current events, the history, uh, mainly off the court field, out of the pool, you know, whatever, off the mat, whatever sport mm -hmm. it is. Uh, make sure uh, going professional sports is your plan B. So your plan A should be to utilize your talent to get a scholarship means to an end. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, if you, again, if you're fortunate enough or blessed enough to have the time and the space and the privilege to go to college, make the most of it. Sure. Um, network at, at an early age. So you need to get a mentor. Uh, you need to be giving back your time, uh, speaking to young people, uh, engaging in young people's affairs and, and sharpening the tool of how to communicate life experience because people are looking up to you. Um, uh, find a mentor, uh, an advisor, because what happens when you're with your mentors is you eventually grow out of them. You'll, you'll, they'll, they'll coach you so well. These mentors will mentor you so well that you outgrow them. And then you have to have someone else. So it's like you have to always be um, seeking more guidance, more advisors. Um, you know, even, you know, you know I admire um, uh, former President Barack Obama. Even as president, he still had advisors. <laughs> well, yeah, right. right There's yeah. like still more. It's like you're never at the top where you don't need any advisor, right? <laughs> or yeah. any mentor. Like there's yeah. always someone with more, or there's always a sector of knowledge that um, you don't have, and so therefore you need someone who has that experience. Yeah. So um, those are a few things, um, and then uh, obviously, um, you know, just be smooth about it. You know, in the event that it happens and um, you are become a professional, be smooth about it. You know, just uh, do your best to be nice as much as you can because um, the ego is a real thing and it's necessary in order to compete at those high stakes with the, that pressure. You need to have a healthy ego and a, a healthy level yeah. of narcissism and egotism. Right. In order to compete on those stages. Um, but then just always be mindful of it and be working your best to uh, have a healthy balance where you can turn it off uh, yeah. like Tom Brady. Um, right. Yeah. Know when it's know when to use it and when not to. Yeah. yeah turn, it on, makes sense. turn it off. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I appreciate you for taking the time to, to come on. Um, it's been super awesome talking with you and you know, when I was thinking about thinking about bringing you on, I, I thought that you'd be sort of this perfect person to be able to talk about you know all the aspects of becoming a pro and, and from seeing the interviews with you in the past. I just thought that'd be you have a great perspective to share. What's the best way for people to uh, follow you and keep track of what you're doing? Yeah, you can uh, follow me at Mr. B Lloyd on Twitter. Um, you can uh, keep up with me at Careerwise Colorado. Uh, dot org um, with our uh, mission to bridge the gap between education and career. You know, at CareerWise, we're the intermediary between uh, employers and the U.S. Department of Labor. We're bringing on uh, white collar jobs to high school students. Oh, okay. And uh, we're working with some of the largest uh, organ enterprise companies. Uh, here in Colorado, Pinnacle Assurance is bringing on 30 apprentices, maintaining that number every year. Uh, given students um, that network, that um, business uh, network that is in, important for students who don't have that luxury of, sure. of seeing four-year uh, higher education in their future, but can get to work right away and start building um, uh, equally as important skills in the, in the workforce. Um, uh, but, you know, we're working with 120 uh, companies um, locally, um, and you can keep up with me on that on uh, LinkedIn also. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's good. Awesome. That's it. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you. I'll, I look forward to sharing those, those links with everyone and uh, people keep track. That's fantastic that you continue to give back and, and help everyone and mentor people. So thank you again for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Ben.